Okay, yeah, so as already introduced, I'm Paul Gersieser from Motional. I lead the data algorithms team. Um, and over the past few years, we've developed a number of data sets, including new scenes and new plan. And today I would like to kind of summarize our journey a bit there and uh, also introduce our future plans, especially around new plan. Um, yeah, let's jump right in. First, I wanna start with a quick introduction to Motional. So I work for Motional. Motional as a brand is only one year old, so you're forgiven if you have not heard of it yet. It's actually, depending on the ranking, considered one of the top five autonomous vehicle uh, companies in the world. It is a joint venture between uh, Hyundai, the Korean car OEM, and Aptiv, which is a tier one automotive supplier. And uh, yeah, it's a four billion joint venture, uh, four billion dollar joint venture, and originally. Um, the startups behind this, this company are Nutonomy and Automatica, which are spun off from MIT and Carnegie Mellon. Yeah, let's look at our timeline a bit closer here. Um, yeah, 2013, we have these two startups spun off out of the universities. Um, 2015, Aptiv acquires Opt Automatica and performs the first cross-country drive uh, in the US uh, from coast to coast, basically. Um, with their vehicles, 2016, uh, Nutonomy was the first company in the world to have like a public um, robotaxi pilot with actual you know, public users. Uh, 2017, Aptiv acquires Nutonomy. In 2018, uh, we had the first commercial robotaxi service uh, in Las Vegas with Lyft. So you could basically get out your Lyft app and call an autonomous vehicle and it would come and pick you up. And the vehicles would be from our company. Uh, 2019, we released a new SYNCE data set that we're going to talk about here, uh, and also a very important safety first for automated driving white paper. 2020, we formed this joint venture, um, so only one year ago, and we also had a big milestone of completing 100,000 rides uh, in, with our public robotaxi fleet in Las Vegas. So of course, there are many more rides that we do internally, but these are the, the public rides that we offer in Las Vegas. And in 2021, uh, we had the, some of the world's first driverless vehicles on public roads. So that means there's no more safety driver involved. And also we switched to our new vehicle platform, which is based on the new Hyundai Ionic 5 vehicle. Okay, our global presence is we have four offices in the US, uh, in California, Las Vegas, Boston and Pittsburgh, and then also in Seoul and Singapore, where I'm based. This is a small video that we created um, during the pandemic. Uh, so of course, COVID uh, stopped us for a while. We needed to introduce new uh, like hygiene protocols and things like that. Uh, but this was basically the video to announce that we are finally back driving uh, with Lyft on the Las Vegas trip. Let's take a quick look at that. Um, there will be no sound for this. So these are our old vehicles with lift. You can see our garage with all the cars lined up there. And yeah, driving across the Las Vegas trip where all the casinos are. We'll also see a bit of like real world footage in a second of that. Um, okay, let's continue. Okay, next I would like to talk a bit about new scenes. <laughs> I call it the new scenes era. Um, I tried to create a little timeline of autonomous driving data sets. So of course, any such timeline really needs to start with the Kitty data set. Uh, Kitty was the first uh, data set for autonomous driving with 3D annotations, and it's still the reference for basically any other data set. So Kitty was in 2012. Um, then much later, 2018, we had Apollo Scapes, which has a number of different benchmarks that put together from this Apollo Scapes data set. Which was quite influential. Also in 2018, we had the, the new scenes teaser data set. So there was like the first announcement, 10% of the data released. It, later in uh, early 2019, both Honda and Argo released their data sets. And then yeah, shortly after, we had the full release of new scenes, uh, what I call new scenes 1.0. And then many other players in the industry followed Lyft, Waymo, Audi, and the ASTAR Research Institute in Singapore all published their data sets. And then in 2020, we extended new scenes with two more data sets, which is LIDASEC and new images uh, to, you know, to augment that offering. And just for fun, I've also added the number of citations. 
So you can really see, of course, over time they become more. So Kitty is the, you know, definitely the leader with 12,000 citations. New Scenes has some 800 at the moment, and then we have Apollo Scapes, Argoverse, way more. Lyft does not have a paper, so no citations here. <laughs> um, yeah, so what, what exactly is New Scenes? Uh, New Scenes, when we released it in 2019, was the largest autonomous vehicle data set. It includes 1,000 scenes with 20 seconds each. Uh, it has data from radars, lidars, and cameras. The whole data is registered and synced. Uh, we have 360 degree sensors, which was not you know, in the case in other data sets at that time. Of course, it's calibrated and it's localized. Uh, so you have very high quality data. Then we annotated that with, like manually annotated that with 1.4 million 3D bounding boxes across 24 free classes. And the data set is available for non-commercial research. And one of the latest updates is we've also made that available for commercial use, at least for startups uh, to enable them because typically startups don't have the budget to buy a data set like this. So we want to really enable them to also get started with these data sets. Okay, then I mentioned we introduced this new scenes uh, version 2.0 data set which is really two extensions. One is adding LIDAR segmentation annotations to new scenes. You can see it in the bottom left corner. So we took the 40,000 keyframes from new scenes. We added point level labels for 1.4 billion points. So we had humans basically color these 1.4 billion points with semantic labels. Um, and the idea is really to go beyond the bounding boxes, have much more detail, but also to focus on the stuff classes. So in Object detection, you only have the moving object, only the objects, foreground objects. Here you have all these background classes like road, sidewalk, building, which are also very interesting to study. And then new images is a large scale image data set. It's, it's independent from new scenes, um, much bigger, 100,000 images with 800,000 2D boxes and masks. You can see an example of that at the bottom right corner. Um, and especially we use active learning techniques here to really make sure that we don't just have you know, very similar images, but very diverse set of images and also focused a lot on the on the rare classes. Here's a little timeline of the different challenges that we did. So we organize about two challenges every year um, on various tasks. We'll, we'll see those tasks in a second. Um, yeah, typically CPR, NURBS, ICRA, IROS, etc. Uh, next one will be NURIPS uh, in December of this year. And of course, besides uh, releasing data sets, we also do a lot of actual research on the map methods. Um, so here's a, an overview of the public research uh, that we did at Motional. So on the detection side, we have our point pillars, uh, efficient uh, encoder for uh, LIDAR-based object detection, 3D object detection. And we have point painting, which is a fusion method. Um, and very recently, we have Polar Stream, which is a streaming method for object detection and LIDAR segmentation. Then on the tracking side, we partnered with uh, Shinshu, which is, of course, one of the organizers of this workshop, uh, and Chris Kitani, uh, to bring their method called AB3D MOT as a benchmark into the, the new scenes data set, the new scenes benchmark. And on the prediction side, we have a method called CoverNet. So prediction means that for every agent in the scene, you try to predict where they're going to be a few seconds into the future. And on the LIDAR segmentation side, we have AMVNet, which we're going to hear about later in one hour roughly. And then again, the polar stream work. So let's look quickly into point pillars. Point pillars was basically our first uh, big uh, work in this field. Um, as I already mentioned, it's a very fast encoder for 3D uh, based object detection only from LIDAR. Uh, so the input is a LIDAR point cloud. The output are the, the object detections. And what we do is, um, that's why it's called point pillar. So we take a pillar, a vertical pillar. Um, we take the points there. We apply a point net to that. We use those features. We stack them up in a pseudo image. And then we just feed them to a standard uh, 2D network. So you have your 2D uh, backbone, and then eventually a detection had something like uh, the single shot uh, detector. Um, so the beauty of that is it's it's very fast. Uh, the, the encoder is very efficient. And then of course, for the backbone and detection head, we could just use whatever was available from uh, 2D images basically. Um, so you have a very lightweight uh, network that still performs pretty well. If you look at these plots, they're of course from uh, 2019. So a bit outdated now, but uh, at that time, we outperformed the existing methods at two to four times the speed. 
And depending on which setup we used, we achieved up to 100 hertz uh, inference time while still having better performance than any of the other methods. Okay, uh, so now a bit tongue in cheek question. Are, are we done yet? Like, is, you know, since this sounds so great, <laughs> uh, were we done in, in 2018? Uh, and if we look at the, the performance, so this is taken from the New Scenes benchmark, this is the performance on the car class. Uh, you can see the recall position curve here. Um, some of the metrics are 80% average position, 90% max recall on cars, depending on which distance threshold we use here. So that sounds pretty okay, you would think, right? <laughs> but if we look at the bicycle class, the picture looks very different. Um, so there, the maximum recall uh, achieved is around 20%. So that means out of five bicycles, we were missing four, <laughs> which is, of course, uh, very bad. Um, and of course, there are a lot of disclaimers here. Uh, so one is, this is really a very simple baseline without all the data augmentations and such that you need to, to get into you know, the top of any leaderboard. Um, then it's also based on individual frames, these statistics. So it doesn't mean that we're really missing those bicycles, but it just means when they're very far away, probably the chance is pretty low of missing them. Uh, it's within a 40 meter range. Um, of course, the closer bicycles would be more important. They could be heavily occluded. Uh, we would still annotate them in our protocol in New Zealand. And of course, the matching criterion also makes a, a big difference here. So that was first version of point pillars, the, the, the simple baseline that we had. Then we had an improved version called Point Pillars Plus. Uh, so here we can see at least it goes to 40% max recall on bikes. It's already twice as good. Um, then we go to point painting. So point painting is a fusion paper that we released. So you basically use the image-based um, semantic segmentation to label uh, the points with the, you know, <laughs> basically add the point label to the points or the scores, therefore. And then you use that in something like uh, Point Pillars. Um, and that method uh, increased the max recall even further to something like 55%. So you can see this fusion really helps. And at that time, that was a state-of-the-art uh, fusion technique. But we're still only at 55%, so we're still missing about half of the bikes. And then if we jump forward a bit to just a few months ago in the latest challenge, uh, there was a submission called Center Point Fusion. So this one uh, brings the max recall to 90% yet. Uh, 90% on bicycles, and it uses all of the bells and whistles that you would find in uh, object detection challenges, uh, including point painting, but also many other tricks. Um, so this is already pretty good, but of course, there's still room for improvement, right? It should be 99.999% and not uh, 90%. So there's still uh, a lot of work that needs to be done here. But it's also amazing to see the progress that we have made in, in three years. So here is an overview of all the relevant uh, submissions in the detection challenge. You can see the x-axis is the time. So it goes from 2019 to, to now. Uh, and the y-axis is the performance in NDS, uh, which is uh, a metric that we developed, uh, which is mostly dependent on MAP, but also some other true positive metrics. And you can see the, the point pillars baseline was somewhere around 0 0.45. Then the winner of the first challenge was a submission by MACV, CBGS, which had huge improvements. Then we had our point painting fusion technique here. Uh, the next challenge to the winner was NOAA CV Lab. Then we have center point V2. And then the latest winner is uh, center point fusion. So again, a fusion technique and based on center point. And if we look at the non LIDAR methods, um, we see uh, RCF, RCF 360v2 and DHnet, of course, much, much further below because without LIDAR, the performance is typically much lower. Um, so if we compare that over 26 months, we have improved the performance by 42% on MAP, which is a, a huge improvement. Similarly, if we look at tracking, uh, we have a number of methods. We have our MACV AB3D MOT baseline uh, at 0.2 MOTA. Um, then we have uh, Stanford IPRL, TRI at 0.55. Then in the latest challenges, we had Noor Octopus, Alpha Track, and lately uh, MLP MOT, uh, also doing fusion, close to 0.7. Um, and again, the LIDAR, the non-LIDAR methods are, of course, mu much further below that. We have QD, 3DT at around 20%. Uh, so there's a huge gap between LIDAR and, and no LIDAR methods. 
And overall, in those 60 months that we've organized the challenges, we've seen a 54% improvement on the AMOTA metric, which is, of course, very enormous. Lighter segmentation, uh, we only started that last year, so not so many methods yet, but uh, we have Polanet uh, as one of our baselines. Then we had Noah Kyber, and the, the latest is SPVCNN, which plus plus, which won the latest challenge. So even here in six months, we achieved a 12% improvement on MIUU as a, as a community, which is pretty amazing. Okay, here is a little announcement. At uh, NURPS, we're going to organize our first uh, panoptic segmentation and tracking challenge. So panoptic segmentation means uh, it's lighter segmentation um, of both the semantic classes and also the instances. That's already a pretty well established task now. Panoptic tracking is new, means basically panoptic segmentation over time. So it's a combination of tracking and panoptic segmentation. Um, yeah, and it's the first benchmark of that kind uh, concurrent with semantic KD, which is, I think, at the same conference uh, equivalent uh, task. Okay, now I would like to introduce the new plan data set. So new plan is very new. We are only going to release the full data set in December this year, uh, but this is a first announcement of what we plan to do. First, let's look a bit at uh, benchmarking data sets in autonomous driving. Uh, so I've tried to write down all of the relevant tasks that came to mind. Uh, of course, there are many more outside of these fields. Um, on the left side, we have all the perception tasks, 3D detection, 3D tracking, LIDAR sec, panoptic LIDAR sec, and panoptic tracking. And then on the right side, we have prediction and planning. Um, and we can see here when they were first established. And it's quite surprising. Uh, detection, of course, was in Kitty, but even 3D tracking uh, only really started in 2018. Then we have LIDAR sec 2019 and the other tasks also 2019 and 2021. Um, so most of that really happened in the last two or three years. Uh, and yeah, prediction uh, started with Argoverse, I would say, in 2019. Um, and then since then, there have been a few data sets like with the Lyft and Waymo, um, which are really, really large and, and focusing on prediction. But if we look at planning, there are basically no large scale data sets uh, for planning yet. Uh, so new plan is trying to really be the first data set in this area. And we hope, of course, that we can have the same huge improvements that we saw in detection and other tasks also on the planning task. Okay, uh, so what is New Plan? New Plan is the world's first large scale ML based planning competition. It's also a data set with 1,500 hours from four cities where we operate. Um, it features closed loop simulation. We'll talk about that in a second. Um, we have scenario specific planning metrics. So, first of all, we have very specific scenarios such as lane changes and so on. And then we have dedicated metrics to these scenarios. We provide the real world sensor data. Uh, which no other prediction or planning data set does. And we plan to organize <laughs> challenges in early 2022. Um, okay. Here is the first demo of what the data set looks like, including the uh, annotations. This is a video where we start at the Paris Casino, which you can see here on the right, so, um, and then drive past the Bellagio. And you can see already that there's the, the density of objects is pretty crazy. If we look at those uh, pedestrians here along the sidewalk, we have literally hundreds of them. Um, also some interesting objects here. This, this vehicle is quite interesting. Uh, and also in terms of the traffic density, it's, there's a lot of stuff going on, which will make this data set very unique compared to other data sets. Here's one more video. So this video nicely shows you the density at intersections in Las Vegas. So we can see this is probably a seven or eight lane in, uh, roads intersecting here. And we can see also on the side uh, uh, ambulance passing us driving over the sidewalk, <laughs> which is of course one of the interesting corner cases that you would like to find in a data set like that. Um, yeah, you can imagine that this is pretty challenging, especially since you, I don't know if you saw that, but the cars here were stopping for that emergency vehicle. So that's behavior that's, of course, uh, you know, not very common to find and yeah, very important to look into closer, more closely. Okay. Okay, let's look at some of the existing benchmarks. 
So in the planning realm, we really only found one benchmark, which is the common road data set from 2017. Uh, it consists of 2,300 pre-recorded scenarios with some uncertainty. Um, most people would argue that this is not enough for like training modern ML methods. It also lacks scenario specific metrics. It lacks the sensor data, but you could consider this the only existing planning benchmark. Then we had three big uh, prediction data sets. Um, Argoverse with 320 hours was quite revolutionary in 2019. They had very simple maps with the center lines in the tribal area, um, but the auto label tracks so the objects that you, you saw there uh, were quite noisy. Um, so it's not human labeled data, it's, it's just generated by an object detection or a tracking method. Um, so the data was, as I said, quite noisy. In Lyft 2020, we had a much bigger data set, 1,000 hours, 1,100 hours from a single route. Um, so it lacks the geographic diversity that you would probably like in a data set like that. But it has much better maps, um, also aerial maps and dynamic traffic light status, which is important for a simulation. Um, but again, very noisy tracks and only a prediction data set, not a planning data set. And then we have Waymo this year with 570 hours collected in six different cities. Um, again, they have semantic maps, they have dynamic traffic light status. The tracks this time are of very high quality. Uh, so that's great, but it's still just a prediction benchmark. The timeline for new plan uh, looks as follows. We announced it in, in June. We will release the data set in December. And then next year, early next year, we'll have planning challenges. And then afterwards, we, will, we have some ideas for other challenges beyond planning. For this data set, we collected data in four cities. Um, we have cameras, LIDARs, GPS, IMU, all the things that you would imagine. Compared to previous data sets, the LiDAR data is much more dense because we have five different LiDARs that we com combine. Uh, so it's a you know, very dense point cloud and very good coverage as well of the environment. Um, and the localization, as usual, is based uh, on very accurate HD maps. So it's not just G GPS and IMU, which in urban environments tends to fail quite often. Um, it's based on HD maps that we generate off offline. And in total, we release 1,500 hours. Um, 1,000 hours are from Las Vegas. We have 250 hours each from Singapore, Pittsburgh, and Boston. And then we'll sort out some of the bad data. So we plan to get to 1,500 hours. And you can see the maps on the right here. Uh, so it's, it's quite a lot of diversity, of course, between Singapore with a lot of like jungle and driving on the left side and very different vehicles. Um, and then Pittsburgh, Boston, and Las Vegas. Uh, Las Vegas, I guess, being the, the most unique place with the casinos and the very wide roads with up to eight or nine lanes. Okay. Here's a quick overview of the, the new plan, DevKit and schema. Uh, so we try to make the schema as close as possible to new scenes because a lot of people are already familiar with that. So it's a relational database of all these tables. Um, yeah, we also, uh, we also release a dev kit, of course, along with the data set, which has basic features like loading the data, visualizing it in, in dozens of ways. Uh, a map API, um, and then the core part is really the, the planning and simulation code, which we'll talk about in a second. Um, we also have scenario tags and traffic light status, which we'll talk about in a second. And then, of course, the usual tutorials that you would expect. First of all, I want to talk about the annotations. So I already mentioned with a data set of this size, you cannot human label the data set. That would not be possible. Uh, so you need to auto label that. Um, and basically what we're using here is we, we mostly focus on the point clouds. We perform uh, object detection using an offline detection method. Then we have batch tracker. Batch tracker basically means that it can optimize over the entire scene and not just uh, the, the past as you would have in a live tracker, an online tracker. And track refinement is another component to globally look at that track and smooth it and maybe correct the, the size uh, so we're combining a number of techniques here. Uh, the overall technique of offline perception comes from a Waymo paper, but there's both a Waymo and an Uber paper to do this track refinement step. Um, so we're combining basically the, the best of both worlds here uh, and some of our own tricks uh, to really get to very accurate tracks in the end. We use that system to label these 1,500 hours of data. Um, and I just want to recap some of the advantages of having this offline perception system. So offline means you run it in the cloud. It can be really slow, but it will be very, very accurate system as compared to an online perception system, which we saw in the older data sets. 
which is what you run on the car, which of course needs to be really fast. Um, so some of the advantages are you can use a lot of LiDAR sweeps, typically 10 or more. You can look at the past and future data, not just the past. Uh, so it's not a causal tracker or detector. Um, you can remove the real time and memory constraints, which is of course very a very big help. And we can find a global solution to the tracking problem rather than just you know, locally <laughs> optimizing that in an online fashion. And we can smooth the tracks and uh, infer a consistent size over the entire track, which is a huge help. And previous work by Waymo has achieved human level labeling performance, but only for cars and only using a very loose IUU threshold. Uh, so there's definitely still room for improvement here, but uh, at least on some classes, this can already get pretty close to human labeling performance. Here are some preliminary results. Uh, this is already an older video with some of the issues you will see here. We've already uh, resolved in the newer version, but this is just to give you an impression of how much is going on there in Las Vegas. So first of all, already on the road, you have a lot of cars moving here simultaneously but then really the, the main thing i guess here is the the sidewalk with the pedestrians dozens of pedestrians walking here uh, you have our car here uh, stuck behind another car trying trying to turn uh, and it's just really difficult for a planning data set to or for a planner to to navigate through these crowds of pedestrians uh, it's a bit of a negotiation <laughs> you try to move for a meter then you get stopped again etc um, yeah so some very challenging data and yeah, some very nice tracks. <laughs> and let's go to the next slide. Okay, as I already mentioned, we also have scenario tags. So basically, um, offline we run uh, scenario mining code to detect things like uh, maneuvers of the ego vehicle, uh, ego and agent interaction, and then also when the ego comes into special areas such as these pick up and drop of areas in the casinos, especially. Um, but then also whenever we enter construction site, that's of course a very special use case where you need to be very, very careful. Um, yeah, then we defined a number of atomic attributes and um, basically our scenarios are SQL queries on top of these attributes. So if you have something, as a random example here, vehicle enters the ego lane ahead, um, so ahead of the ego, then that could be phrased, this is a bit of pseudocode here, but it can be phrased as an SQL query where you basically select the data where there's an agent, uh, which is a car, it has a distance less than 50 meters, it's ahead of us, the speed is bigger than five meters per second, ego speed is also bigger than five meters per second, and it does enter the ego lane. So this is how we find these uh, scenarios. Then of course, um, for a simulation, it's really important to have traffic lights. We also saw that in the Lyft and Waymo data sets that they provide these traffic lights. Um, and we came up with two different approaches to infer these traffic lights. Approach one is uh, very straightforward, what probably most computer vision people would do. You run a traffic light detection network, you take those boxes, you associate them with your map, and then you run a hidden Markov model or some other technique to smooth the data. Um, that will give you a pretty good performance in the close to medium range um, that you observe in your cameras. But of course, what the problem is what you do not see here. Since we are not just doing the non-reactive agent part, we'll see that in a second, um, but we also have reactive agents. It's really important that these agents get the traffic light status uh, as an input. So if we only have the forward facing traffic lights, the, the traffic lights that face us, um, then that's not enough. We really need all of the traffic lights at the intersection simultaneously. So the other approach that we're investigating is really using the object motion inference. So um, we, we have vehicles moving across the, the stop lines, uh, and that's a very good indicator that hopefully they're crossing the green light, at least if it's a lot of them. There could be maybe individual people crossing the red light as well. But overall, you will infer that that must be a green light if a lot of cars are crossing it. Then you can try to fill in the gaps. And the idea is really that this covers all the directions at the intersection. Um, the downside, of course, is you don't have any signal if nobody is crossing uh, that traffic light. So if an, a lane is empty, you don't know what is happening there. Um, and then, of course, it's difficult to incorporate special rules like uh, turn right at the traffic light uh, in, in the US. 
Okay, now I would like to talk about the new plan planning simulation. So the goal of this planning simulation is really to create a simulation pipeline to evaluate a planner on a large scale data set with various scenarios. Uh, we score the planner performance with common and scenario dependent metrics. Um, and we compare different planners based on measured metrics, and then we provide intuitive visualizations and metrics to, to look at and analyze what's going on there. Um, we train the planners with a provided framework to allow for very quick implementation and iteration. And very important, we support closed loop simulation and also training. So the idea is really that you can do everything in this tool from training your own method to debugging it to evaluating it and comparing to other methods. And these are tools which every big autonomous vehicle company has, but uh, researchers, especially academic researchers, don't typically have because there's just so many scenarios and so many metrics to think of uh, that you know, it's too much work to, to in, uh, implement for an individual. Here's an overview of uh, the, the planning challenges that we organize. So roughly speaking, there are three tracks um, and these tracks can be either open loop or closed loop. Um, open loop for an ego or an agent means that the predictions do not affect the simulation. So you can think of that as you're just replaying the log and that every time step you're asking like, what, what do you want to do? Uh, whereas closed loop uh, means the predictions do affect the simulation. So you predict something, you will move towards that direction, and then these um, novel states affect the simulation. So you're kind of diverging from what was recorded in the log. And of course, then it becomes a bit of a negotiation between the, the vehicles, which uh, becomes quite interesting. So we have three setups. First one is open loop for both ego and agent. And the inputs here can be either raw sensor data, which would be point clouds or LIDAR data, or the perception boxes from our auto label data set. The second option is the ego is closed loop, which means the ego can diverge from the log, but the agent are still played back from the log. Of course, that means they are non reactive and could, in some cases, be uh, not very clever. And then the, the all closed loop alternative means both ego and agents are in closed loop. And here we provide uh, different agent, reactive agent policies, such as on rails um, and also learned machine learning uh, policies. And we provide a number of baselines here so that users can experiment with all of them. Here's a quick overview of our simulation and evaluation framework. Um, we have in our simulation engine different observations. So it could be the raw sensor data or perception boxes. We have different planners. As I said, they can be rule-based, they can be learned, et cetera. Um, we have different agent models. We can replay the log. We can do this on-rails model where you basically play back the log, but only stop when you're hitting an obstacle or <laughs> before you're hitting an obstacle. And we have these ML policies, uh, which are really the focus here with this large-scale data set. Um, and then in terms of the controller, we have either the perfect control, which is, is kind of teleporting to wherever you want to go, or we have an actual kinematic model, which you know realistically uh, limits what your planner uh, was outputting to, to a feasible trajectory. Uh, then we can perform open and closed loop evaluation. We have a metrics engine to compute all these different metrics, either common metrics that apply to any scenario or very scenario specific metrics. Um, and then we have dashboards to visualize both the metrics and uh, yeah, the final simulation, show, show the actual simulation. And some features of our simulation engine, we really want to be agnostic to data sets and implementations by abstracting all these components. So basically, you can take any component, uh, just you know, throw out what we have and then use your own implementation as long as you comply with the uh, interfaces. So we want to be data set independent. We want to allow any, any of the data sets, which means that you could also use all these prediction data sets like Waymo and Lyft and use them for planning. We want to have any kind of observations from boxes to sensor-based data. We want to support different planners, different controllers, uh, different types of simulation, open or closed loop, um, any, any metric that comes to mind. And we also want to solicitate feedback from the community about new metrics that may be interesting that we could add in the official benchmark. Um, and then any, any dashboard um, to, to visualize uh, the, the results. And of course, the whole thing needs to be scalable, which is quite a challenge. Uh, so new plan as a whole has some 300,000 scenarios, and we believe that maybe 100,000 of these could be interesting. Um, 
but that's still a lot of data to evaluate if you if you evaluate your planner in roughly real time um there's still a lot of data to <laughs> churn through um, and of course you want to support large-scale training and evaluation here's a quick look at our training framework which we also provide to the public so it's a modular framework design we support diverse planning baselines it's tightly integrated with the new plan simulation so training an open loop method is pretty easy you can just you know pick a sample <laughs> and train on that um, but in closed loop, of course, you need to use the actual simulation inside your training framework to really see what, what happens in the future, a few steps into the future. Um, so it's kind of this unrolling of the simulation in closed loop training. Then we also support end-to-end -end models. So that means a model that takes in, for example, the camera feed and directly outputs the planning commands. Uh, we have planning tailored data augmentation. We have curriculums to do like important sampling or weighting of samples. Um, and then the data set pipeline here is also again agnostic, uh, data set agnostic. Okay, let's take a look at the simulation. This is a very simple, actually handcrafted uh, planner baseline. Um, we can just see what that will look like. Uh, you see all these these agents in green moving around with the, the scores. Uh, and then here our EVO vehicle with the planet trajectory. And here occasionally that we try to uh, overtake here a few cases. Yeah, overall, it's a relatively simple use case, this one. But you can see nicely how that, yeah, here you can see that we're slowing down a lot because of the <laughs> congestion here. Um, and then, of course, at some point, we'll also have more sophisticated machine learning based uh, baselines to really get the state of the art methods here. Okay. This is our metrics dashboard. So there will be a number of features from uh, showing scalar metrics at the top. We don't see them here. Uh, then what we have on the right side is histograms. So you can compare different planners here, planner one and planner two on metrics like the maximum distance from the goal um, and just see how they compare. Uh, and you can evaluate on that on, let's say, tens of thousands of scenarios and then see the statistics here. We also have um, kind of a timeline, so you can see over the course of this scene, how did those two planners compare, where was which planner better. Um, I think that will be really interesting once we have, uh, you know, the all the leading uh, state of the art planners in here. Uh, the whole thing has a web based uh, dashboard, so it's run with Bouquet, so you can, it's basically JavaScript, you can run it in the browser or on a homepage if you want. Um, we analyze various metrics and statistics across different scenarios. Uh, and the important thing, as I said, you can compare different plans here. So future work is uh, we will release this full data set in December. We will organize planning challenges in early 22. Um, we will continuously expand the training framework and baselines. So both the features of the training framework, but then actually also the, the methods that we, that we have in there. Um, we want to get in touch with the community regarding both scenarios and metrics. So we'll provide maybe you know, 50, 30 or 30 scenarios and 50 metrics in the beginning. Uh, but then there are obviously many, many more that may be interesting. Uh, so any feedback that you have, just send us an email. Um, and then we want to organize many more challenges also in other realms like mapping, localization, etc. So if you have any ideas there, let us know. Yeah, this is the team behind just new plan. Then of course we have a much bigger team behind new scenes, which I can show here. Um, yeah, here are two screenshots from a part of the company. You can guess which one is uh, during COVID and which one was <laughs> way before that. And if you are interested in joining us for an internship or a full-time position, uh, just send me an email or go to our careers page. Yeah, that's everything from my side.